Okay, welcome to the fourth uh, VZB Distinguished Lecture in Social Sciences. This is our second lecture in economics and overall our fourth lecture. Uh, last year in economics we had Torsten Persson here, so some of you might have been here already. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker to you, Fabrizio Cilibotti. Fabrizio's work is impressive on many accounts. As an experimental microeconomist, I'm of course thrilled by the sheer scope of his work in geographic terms, but also with respect to the complexity of the social environments that he addresses in his work. But not only that, he studies questions of great political and social relevance and contributes to the fundamental understanding of urgent problems such as ethnic conflict, child labor, economic growth and its determinants, as well as the survival of the welfare state and redistribution between generations. It would take too long to list all of Fabrizio's achievements, prizes, and seminal publications. Thus, I've decided to first point out the major steps in his academic career, and then take a little bit more time to talk about the substance of his work by giving you the story that he tells in two of his papers. Actually, I had prepared three because I was so enthusiastic about the papers, but it takes too long, so I will... Uh, uh, only do two. Fabrizio started his studies in Bologna and then went on to the LSE where he completed his PhD. He became a young professor at Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona and then moved to Stockholm with a brief interlude at UCL and from there to the University of Zurich where he holds a professorship since 2006. This outstanding career has been in many ways a European career while he's an internationally recognized scholar with an enormous global impact. He has worked at most of the top universities in Europe, has received an ERC Advanced Investigator Grant entitled Institutions, Policy and Culture in the Development Process, and he's currently the president of the European Economic Association. He has received the Irieu Janssen Award in 2009 for the best economist in Europe under the age of 45. Also, he's the chief editor of the Journal of the European Economic Association and was board member and managing editor of the Review of Economic Studies, the only top, top five journal in economics that is produced in Europe. At the same time, he's highly recognized for his outstanding work, work outside of Europe. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society. Um, he recently received China's most important award in economics, the Sun Yifang Award in 2012. Thus, Fabrizio is a true European whose work has received global recognition, and that's not so common, I should say. Now, let me turn to the second part of my introduction, which deals with his incredibly fascinating work. What exactly is Fabrizio's contribution to the field of economics that makes his work so extraordinary? The easy answer is that it is part of a major movement to put institutions back into macroeconomics. When I was a student, the theory of economic growth had no firms, no laws, no governments, no social groups, etc. This has changed dramatically over the past years, and Fabrizio's work, together with some others, mostly co-authors of him, is responsible for this paradigm shift. But what does this mean, institutions and macroeconomics? Let me try to give you two examples, and I will leave out everything on China, as we, he will himself talk uh, about that uh, in his lecture. But I would like to tell you about two of his papers that uh, have been very influential and that are really interesting contrib contributions. Um, the first one, uh, first paper is called Rotten Parents and Disciplined Children. And in this paper, he asks the questions why we don't have more government debt than we actually have. Since only current generations vote, there's a natural tendency to accumulate debt, that is for present generations to spend more than what they have. What then prevents the current generations from passing the bill for current spending to future generations? And here is the answer that Fabrizio provides. The idea is that countries differ with respect to how much they care about public goods relative to private consumption. Now the key idea is that a strong preference for public good strengthens the fiscal discipline because it, and uh, why does it do so? Because it keeps governments from accumulating large government debt and the reason is that only a country that does not have to spend all its revenue for the service of the debt has money to provide for public goods. This can explain why economies with large government 
such as, for example, the Scandinavian countries, have tighter fiscal policies than countries such as Greece and Italy, which have larger debt and arguably provide fewer public goods. Um, the second paper I would like to talk about uh, briefly is called War Signals, a Theory of Trade, Trust, and Conflict. This paper provides an interesting perspective on the big and recurring question of the relationship between peace on the one hand and the existence of markets and trade on the other. So you might ask, what's new about this if stamps already posit this relationship? Um, the, what's new is that Fabrizio provides a theory that spells out the exact channels through which trade and conflict are related. And by doing this, he's able to draw important policy recommendations from that. Two ingredients of this model, are well, of his model here, are well known to microeconomists. Um, that's also why I liked it. So there's asymmetric information in it and there's social learning. The authors build on a well-established and not surprising correlation between trust in a population and the frequency of civil wars, where causality can go either way. That is, wars can destroy trust and trust, trust can avoid wars. And by the way, trust in this figure here is measured by the question, can most people be trusted? And here you see the, um, the relationship. Now, if conflicts between groups render business relationships between these groups impossible, then the opportunity costs of conflict are the benefits from trade. Therefore, the better the trade opportunities, the less attractive is war. But what's the role of trust here? The idea is that often trade or business opportunities in general require investments on both sides. For example, you might have to learn the language of the other group to trade with. Now, trust simply means the belief that the other community is undertaking the necessary investments. This is where the asymmetric information and the social learning enters. Each group now has a specific cost of these investments, or in other words, a propensity to trade. Um, sorry. And this is only known to the group itself and not to the other group. So the belief um, in this propensity to prepare for trade by the other group is called trust. So I trust in them uh, being willing to trade. The higher the expectation that the other group will want to trade, the higher the trust. And now comes another element of the theory of uh, uh, asymmetric information, namely signaling. A group that starts a conflict thereby signals that its propensity to trade is low. That is, that it's not trustworthy. Thereby, conflict reduces trust. Um, and the model then assumes that the agents update these beliefs uh, or the level of trust and uh, give it on to the next generation. Thus, trust and war are negatively correlated. And the model now is, is very beautiful because it can explain a number of empirical findings such that the longer a period of peace, the lower the probability of a civil war. Also, some policy conclusions can be derived. The model shows that the higher the gains from trade, the less conflict. Thus, policies reducing trade barriers, such as education in the national languages, for example, can be effective in reducing the probability of intergroup conflicts. On the other hand, peacekeeping forces that try to impose peace through coercion are not effective in the long term as trust is not restored. That is, no positive expectations about business opportunities are generated. Um, now I'm not telling you about child labor. That's a great paper. You can read it yourself. Uh, but I'm going to finish uh, uh, by saying um, that um, I'm very grateful that Fabrizio is here. I'm very much looking forward to his lecture uh, on a topic that has become central to his work, namely uh, the development of China. Fabrizio. So first of all, I would like uh, to thank uh, uh, Vincent Pei for uh, inviting me. I'm very honored to give this uh, distinguished lecture in social sciences. And uh, I'm especially grateful to Dorothea for this introduction. I thought that maybe she should also present my slides. She was so clear that I don't think I, should, I will do a better job. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and she was also kind of leaving aside uh, uh, the work of China. This is not uh, a specific paper, but it's based uh, somehow on a survey that uh, Shenzhou has Latin and uh, I've been writing for the uh, annual review uh, of, of economics that uh, put together both some of our research 
and also some more general thinking about, uh, about uh, uh, China. Actually, this picture comes from the inaugural conference of the uh, ERC grant, which was actually focused on, on, on China, that we held uh, in 2008, if I remember correctly. And it's a view of uh, Pudong uh, uh, from the colonial quarter of Shanghai. Uh, so that was a few years ago. This is now. And I think that this, uh, this makes uh, the point actually in more than one respect. The first you see, look at the density. You know, this is a slightly different perspective, but certainly it's an amazing number of new uh, impressive buildings. Although, you know, here in Berlin also you have, uh, you have had uh, a lot of uh, growth in, in, in that respect, especially in this area. But certainly, you know, Shanghai is, is a symbol of that, of that growth. But the other thing I want to comment, uh, uh, because, you know, when you talk about China, there's something uh, real, and I think these are skyscraper, they are really there. Uh, there is something that sometimes is a bit more dubious. That's the color of the sky. I go often to Shanghai, I continue to see it more frequently like this than like that. But that's another story. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, I find, you know, as a, as a growth economist, uh, I thought that at some point I couldn't uh, help but uh, study China uh, for what it has meant in, in the change in which the world, the contemporary world, looks uh, today. Uh, so let me tell you something that, that most of you already already know, uh, but just you know to, to calibrate uh, what, what we're going to see later. Uh, China has a population of 1.34 billion uh, uh, people. Uh, that means 30% uh, more than uh, the entire set of, uh, let's call them Western-like uh, uh, democracies. So you put together the EU, the United States, uh, Japan, and other Western offshoots, uh, you get to something like uh, uh, 1 billion people. Uh, if you put together all the African population, it's uh, slightly more than 1 billion people. So, so China is obviously more than one country. It's a, it's a very important uh, and large part of the world. Uh, China is also uh, becoming more and more of an economic force in, uh, in, in terms of uh, its absolute uh, level. Uh, if one looks at uh, the statistics and uh, converts uh, GDP at the current exchange rate, uh, one gets the, the wrong impression that China is still something like 50% uh, uh, of the United States. Uh, in reality, once uh, uh, adjustment for uh, purchasing power parity is made, uh, China is uh, uh, very close uh, to, to the United States. Here, estimates uh, vary. You, you may have read uh, on The Economist recently that some people even argue that China has already surpassed uh, the, the United States. Now, in spite of this uh, large uh, economic size, that of course uh, uh, is uh, uh, you know one one uh, of the, the sign of its uh, uh, importance in the in the world economy, the level of development of China is still uh, one of the of the middle income a middle income country. So uh, China is still. Uh, so, so the, the average, the, the, the GDP per capita in 2012 is about 20% uh, 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 the corresponding fi figure for uh, uh, the United States. Uh, and sometimes it's useful also to compare it with our other emerging economies. Uh, China is uh, significantly richer than, uh, than, than India, as, as we know, but it's uh, uh, still, as, as, as its average uh, uh, GDP is below countries like South Africa and Brazil, let alone, uh, let alone Russia. I want to make this point because there's a lot of talk today about, uh, uh, you know, after 30 years or 20 years at least of high growth, China is uh, set to slow down. I'm going to argue, yes, to some extent, but uh, uh, don't forget that the potential of growth just through technological convergence of China is enormous. Uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, even with all the uh, uh, doubt uh, and question and quibble we can have about its institutional framework, uh, uh, just look at the comparison between China and Russia, so, for instance. Now, all of this happened uh, very rapidly, and uh, we don't have any uh, such example in, uh, in, uh, uh, in economic history that uh, can be mentioned. So, China in the late 1970s was one of the poorest countries in the world. Its GDP was a mere 4% uh, of the uh, uh, corresponding GDP per capita, was a mere 4% of the corresponding level for the United States. Then the process of economic reform started, and its, uh, 
it's one of these cases in which one cannot escape to say that the, the two were related. So China had a, a growing trajectory. Here you see the GDP per capita for China as a percentage of the United States. So it's, it's a picture of the speed of convergence. There was already some convergence uh, in the 80s and in the 90s, but then there has been an explosion in the growth rate uh, uh, in uh, uh, the first decade of the uh, 21st uh, century. And if we look at what it means uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, the compa comparable countries, well, if we go back to the late 1970s, uh, China was a poorer country than uh, Nigeria, than uh, uh, India, and Brazil was uh, in another league. Well, you see, the, the trajectory of convergence has put China clearly ahead of India. Nigeria has had uh, a very uh, bad decade in the 1990s, and now it's a much poorer country than China. So again, uh, uh, the, the GDP of China today is comparable to the lower end of, the, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, countries in, in the EU. It's still not there, but not far from. One of the uh, story one often here is that this went together with a tremendous uh, increase in inequality. And that is uh, certainly true. I'm going to talk about that uh, uh, later. We shouldn't forget, however, that uh, even the, the poorest part of the Chinese society has been lifted up by the process of growth. And if we think about uh, uh, what uh, the main achievement of the process of economic uh, development in terms of poverty over the last uh, uh, 30 years, well, China has, uh, the is the lion's share of it. In uh, 1980, this, is, this data from the World uh, Bank Development Indicators, 84% of the population was living uh, with less than 1.25 US dollar uh, daily. And uh, in 2010, where we have the last point observation, that was uh, uh, just above uh, 10%. Now, uh, to be honest, uh, this, some, some studies question the exact nature of this. Uh, so th some, some study uh, uh, argue this is exaggerated because it does not take into account some changes in the relative prices that have been uh, uh, unfavorable to the poorer part of the uh, Chinese society. So well, this graph may exaggerate that, that, that a sense, but I think that nobody would question that there has been a, an incredible uh, achievement in terms of poverty reduction. China was also a completely closed economy until the end of the 1980s. Well, uh, I will talk about uh, uh, some limited amount of uh, uh, openness to foreign investment in the 1980s, but uh, in the 1990s, contribution to world trade was uh, negligible. Today, count, today, China is the uh, uh, major exporting uh, power uh, worldwide. So if we look at the last uh, decade, as I was uh, uh, saying, China has uh, actually accelerated its, uh, its growth rate. Uh, there is uh, usually some uncertainty about the, the extent of the growth rate, so I'm reporting two data sources that uh, actually don't, uh, don't uh, uh, fully agree. Uh, the Pan World Table would give you a growth rate, an annual growth rate of uh, GDP per capita in the order of 8%. The World Bank would uh, give you a 9.5%. Uh, Whichever the truth, or even if uh, both were, were, were overestimated, uh, you see the difference uh, with respect to uh, a decade that, uh, you know, due to the, what happened in, in the last part of it, uh, was not particularly uh, flourishing for, for the Western uh, world. Uh, and, uh, you know, this means that if you take the World Bank estimate, uh, the average uh, living standards uh, uh, would have gone up by a factor of three between 2000 and 2012. Now, since 2012, uh, there has been a slowdown of the growth uh, process. And there is a lot of discussion in these days in the, in the economic press and also in the, uh, in the ordinary press about whether is, this is somehow the beginning of the end. I will say something uh, in the second part of my presentation. I just want uh, here to to tell you what the numbers are. So in 2013, 
uh, the GDP per capita grew at 7.7%, which is, uh, uh, in any case, by, by any standard, a very, very high growth rate. Uh, the slowdown is not something that uh, has affected China alone, but it has affected a number of emerging economies. Some of them have actually performing, uh, been performing pretty well during the great crisis, and China has slowed down less than other economies like India or, uh, uh, or Brazil. So in the rest of the presentation, I'll go over a number, uh, not all because for, for, for time constraint, but I, I will go over a number of the themes of uh, my, uh, uh, the paper that uh, I think has been distributed. Uh, in that paper, we, we try to answer, uh, you know, very partially even there, of course, uh, three grand questions. The first is, why was uh, China so poor in the 1970s? The second is, what was the trigger of the process of uh, reform uh, since 1979? And the third, which is, as, uh, as always, the, the, the most difficult, to try to make sense of uh, what you should expect uh, about, uh, about the future. Uh, I will not uh, talk about the historical part today, and I will focus, most, uh, and I will focus entirely on the second and the third uh, point. So China, uh, the process of economic reform started, as we know, uh, after the, de the death of Mao Zedong and the, the leadership of uh, uh, the paramount leadership, as they call it, of the Deng Xiaoping. Uh, and uh, in the 1980s, these reforms transformed China from uh, a, a socialist, uh, rigidly planned economy into a mixed uh, economy. Actually, the process of economic reforms, if one wants to try to uh, pin down explicit moment uh, in which uh, new measures were taken, it's, uh, it's not so easy. With the exception of the one-child policy, where the date is very clear, well, there was a meeting in the December 1978 where some reforms were undertaken, but. Uh, other reforms, like the household responsibility system, which was very important in increasing the amount of food production in China, were not really uh, thought uh, by the leadership and then implemented. Rather, they happened in the society, and the, 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 the leadership uh, started tolerating and treat them as experiments, uh, and uh, somehow allowing uh, more freedom, and at some point, even endorsing them. So household responsibility system meant a system by which uh, 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 farmers, uh, uh, peasants could retain part of the product of the uh, state-owned farms. Uh, this system uh, gave rise to a fantastic increase in productivity. Uh, unfortunately, it's very hard to, to, to make uh, an estimate of how important that was. Of course, we have aggregate statistics about uh, productivity, but uh, we don't have uh, an, an exact and precise uh, uh, extent of how this was diffused in different parts of China, for instance. The same is true for the so-called township and village enterprises, which gave rise to new form of, uh, of uh, enterprises uh, uh, collectively owned and partially also individually owned already in the 1980s, especially in, in rural area. The other thing that, uh, the, the, the other policy that was introduced, the special economic zones, is the one in which I will have something more to say. Part because I have uh, uh, some information that is more measurable, and so I can use statistical method to try to figure out how important it was. Well, uh, before turning to that, uh, a, a bit more of chronology. In the late 1980s, uh, uh, China underwent a, a uh, important uh, economic and political crisis. There was a growth slowdown, there was the emergence of cases of corruption, and there was a big division inside the party about uh, uh, which route should be taken. Some arguing that uh, uh, even the, 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 the limited reforms of the 1980s were taking the country out of its uh, 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 socialist way, and other arguing for faster uh, reform. Well, in 1989, after the death of Yu Yaobang, uh, there was a, a, the dramatic repression of the protest in Tiananmen Square uh, and the expulsion of many reformist members of the, of the Communist Party of China. Some felt, uh, some thought that this was the end of it. Uh, then what happened between 1989 and 1992? I know here we, uh, I will have some discussants uh, with expertise in, uh, in politics uh, and probably no more than me, but my impression, my reading is that it's very 
uh, we have very limited information of the dynamics inside the parties. Uh, we know that at the end in 1992, uh, in a very informal way, Deng Xiaoping uh, did a travel in the southern part of the country where he made uh, uh, open statement uh, about uh, a renewed impulse to the process of economic reforms. Note that uh, this economic reform did not mean and has not meant until today a process of political democratization. Well, the 1990s is the decade where the most profound uh, economic reform were made. The 2000s was the decade where growth was fastest, but uh, uh, the, the leadership of the, the last decade has not been particularly dynamic in terms of economic reform. Some argue, in fact, in some way, uh, uh, Hu Jintao went back. Uh, it was under the leadership of Yang Zemin that most of the uh, uh, key economic reforms were made. So, in particular, uh, the new principle that uh, was uh, uh, installed was that state-owned enterprise, which was which was something uh, that was were taken for granted to be for life uh, in the in the socialist uh, you know in, in the pre-market reform China, were forced to compete in uh, a market economy, and they were forced to compete first with foreign-owned enterprises and later with uh, uh, enterprise entirely owned by uh, uh, Chinese entrepreneurs. So this started already to be true in the 1990s, as we see in the data, but it was in 1997 that it received the blessing of the Communist Party of China in the 15th Congress. And the new strategy of uh, uh, economic growth uh, and uh, uh, was, was elaborated there, grab the large enterprise, release a small one, means uh, the state is not going to withdraw altogether. It will retain a strong uh, role in the economy, but only in, with uh, a limited number of firms and in a limited number of, uh, of sectors. There were also some other uh, important uh, policy uh, uh, in, uh, intervention. The expansion of the special economic zones. So again, I will talk more in detail about this, but uh, uh, the, the, special, the first special economic zones were very important because they introduced also a new experimental setting, but it was in the 1990s that this was uh, expanded uh, to altogether to a large number of cities and areas in, in China. There was a housing market reform that essentially introduced a uh, market for, for, uh, for uh, dwellings. Uh, there was the introduction in 1997 of the, of, the, of the modern pension system. Earlier on, the, the pension was provided by the uh, state-owned firms. So when, a, when, a, when an employee would stop working, he would continue to receive some pay in the form of a pension. But of course, uh, in a new reality in which uh, some firms would disappear, that was no longer viable. Um, and then in 2001, Ch China became a member of the WTO. This gives you a sense of the transformation that uh, we observed in the, in the following decades, so after the 15th Congress of the Communist Party, uh, look at, the, at the, the solid line, that's the share of, uh, 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 the, that's the employment share of uh, private firms in manufacturing. So in 1998, it was a very small share, about 4%. Uh, in 2008, it was already 60%. And later on, it has actually uh, slowed down this process of privatization, and I will have something to say, to say about that. Now, in the, first, in, this, uh, um, in, the, in the next part of the talk, I want to talk about uh, uh, some uh, specific uh, uh, piece of, pieces of research where, uh, you know, in, in actually not in all three I'm involved, but uh, uh, I think that they, they, they capture some salient uh, uh, issues, uh, uh, so some salient aspect of the process of economic reform and the nature of a transformation that China underwent uh, uh, in, the, in the 1990s uh, and uh, in the, in the end in the 2000s as well. So the first uh, is an attempt to quantify the effect of the industrial policy, in particular the special economic zones that uh, I already mentioned and I will uh, expand about. The second is uh, some study that look at the system of political incentives and the implication of this system of political incentive on economic growth, but also of what uh, some people call the environmental disasters of China. And 
the third point will have to, I will go into this uh, uh, issue of what privatization meant for the uh, type of economic growth, in particular to the, the, the importance of the export and, and trade surplus during, during the, uh, the, the last uh, 15 years. So the first, uh, the first is based on joint work uh, with uh, Simon Alder and Lin Shao. Uh, and uh, again, we, what we, we try to do is to exploit the fact that special economic zones were introduced uh, in China uh, in a staggered fashion. So they were introduced in different uh, periods in different cities. So there is a variation uh, both uh, across uh, space uh, and uh, over time. And so this gradual implementation gives us some uh, source of variation that is not ideal, as I will say, but that is better than just making a comparison between cities that became special economic zones and, and cities that, uh, uh, that did not. The, the stated goal was to promote uh, 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 technological upgrade uh, to foster investment, foreign direct investment. There was also a very important aspect which has to do with experimenting with new economic policies. So, uh, in fact, if you want, although, although there are many types of special economic zones uh, and there is a lot of uh, heterogeneity and diversity, if I want to summarize the type of treatment, what it meant, well, remember, special economic zones were aimed, the aim was to attract foreign direct investment, so they were offering tax exemptions and less restrictive regulation on foreign exchange to, to uh, uh, foreign investors. They were offering them also lower land use price, and uh, local leadership was given autonomy in designing the policy. An example, the city of uh, Shenzhen, uh, close to the border with Hong Kong, introduced the first labor market of China when this was unthinkable, before people were just allocated to different uh, type of, uh, of jobs uh, in an administrative way. So this uh, element of experimentation, of uh, trying a policy and then to expand it if it works, uh, has been very explicit in the policy making uh, of, of China. Now, what the, the special economic zone is not just a, a thing of the past. Sometimes people have in mind Shenzhen and the cities that were uh, Hainan that were, were started in the 1980s. It continues to be an important uh, element of the policy making today. It's just a different type of special economic zones. So, for instance, recently uh, uh, China has launched the, the Pudong free trade zones, where the experimentation has been moved from just attracting foreign direct investment, which remains an uh, uh, important element uh, uh, of that, to also also making uh, 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 some experiment on, on forms of financial liberalization. So let me give you the picture about how these special economic zones were introduced. In the 1980s, there were just uh, a few dots. I don't know if you can uh, really see them here. That's uh, Shenzhen and, uh, and, and, the, and the three other uh, cities. Uh, in 1988, it, there was uh, an expansion to a few other coastal areas. So this was uh, very much uh, uh, localized uh, in the east of China. In 1992, there was uh, the big expansion of uh, uh, the special economic zones to the, to the inland China. And this expansion was largely based uh, on some administrative criteria. So, for instance, the capital, or all capital, although not only those, but all capitals of uh, inland provinces were granted uh, uh, the, the status, uh, or, or part of the city at least was granted the status of special economic zones. More was done in 2000, 2005, and 2010. So, as I was saying, uh, this variation is useful for, for us to understand uh, uh, and, and to assess also quantitatively what, uh, what went on. Uh, and for this, we use uh, data at the prefectural uh, uh, city level. So, we have data for China at the city level. Of course, this data on China and, and, and more so the local data uh, should be subject to some scrutiny. Otherwise, we get, uh, again, the blue sky on Shanghai that we don't know if it is produced by, by the reality or by some uh, smart filter. So we try, we try to do something about that. Now, uh, one big problem is that just comparing naively the performance of special economic zone with non-special economic zones is problematic because uh, there is no guarantee that these zones are selected randomly. In fact, if we look especially at the first set of uh, special economic zones, these were typically chosen to be close to ports and rivers next to Hong Kong, etc. So one might suspect that uh, they might have performed equally well without uh, special economic zones. 
So what is our uh, strategy here? Well, on the one hand, we, we, we try as much as possible to deal with heterogeneity, and we do so by filtering out uh, uh, time-invariant heterogeneity and also time-varying heterogeneity, uh, which is province-specific. Provinces are uh, large units, but uh, you know, we, we try to refrain as much as possible to compare what happens in, in, a, in a, um, uh, a prosperous uh, uh, province in, in east of China with uh, what happens to cities in, uh, in the uh, poorer area in the west. So this uh, allows us to compare a bit more, at least, equals with equal. The other thing that we can do is actually to use a within estimator that allows us to compare the trends before and after the onset of the special economic zones. So the identification comes to comparing within the same city what happens at the time in which this city is granted the status of special economic zones. Do we see an acceleration in its, uh, in its growth and how persistent uh, uh, is this? Um, <clears throat> Something that we can also do is to see if the re uh, results are robust in a set of cities where the selection problem looks less severe. In particular, uh, as I said, in, the 19, in 1992, but also later, a number of cities received the status of special economic zones on the basis of uh, a particular uh, uh, well, uh, predefined administrative uh, rules. Uh, we, we can control for pre-reform trends, so we can see if uh, the cities that were treated actually were already doing well, better before and to what extent, and we can perform some placebo uh, exercises. To deal with uh, the data quality issue, uh, what we do is we check uh, how the uh, results hold up, where, inst where instead of using the, st the Chinese statistics that uh, uh, some people uh, find suspicious, uh, we use uh, data from the uh, satellite light. So these data are constructed by, by looking from the satellite how much light you have in, in different areas. I will show you some pictures the more development is associated with more light. Interesting, when we do this check, we do not find a big discrepancy between the official data and the light data, which is somehow reassuring. The last thing that we worry is the extent to which uh, establishing a, set, a certain spatial economic zones in an area of a city it might be that that, seat, that part of the city uh, becomes prosperous, but just because uh, the next part of the area of the city becomes poorer, so it just attracts resources that otherwise would go elsewhere. Well, we do some uh, analysis of the extent to which uh, uh, city core uh, perform relative to uh, the surrounding areas, and we found that actually uh, even the area surrounding special economic zones typically did better than other areas, which is again reassuring. Well, this is a, a summary of what we found. We find the effect, the differential effect of the special economic zones after the reform is something of the order of a 20% level effect. Uh, is this uh, large or small? Well, we conclude, we say it's significant. It's not huge in a country where the, grow, the annual growth rate uh, is of the order of, uh, of 8%, but this is a differential effect and it is, uh, it is not ne negligible either. Also it, also, it does not take the form of a permanent divergence, but rather of uh, an upgrading in the, in the level. Well, here is just uh, to give you the sense of what we do with the light. This is the whole of China, and you can see there is, uh, uh, there is uh, more light in, in areas like Beijing and Shanghai than uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, the west of China. And, and an example of how we use that, uh, that information is given by these two cities, Xinjiang and Foshun. You see Xinjiang and Foshun were almost neighboring city uh, in 1992. Then uh, Xinjiang was uh, uh, granted the, sta the state of a special eco economic zone, Foshun was not, uh, and you see that Foshun actually developed, uh, uh, developed less. It's not exactly uh, uh, the, the best uh, description because we, we actually use uh, the variation that comes within uh, uh, Xinjiang, as I have mentioned before, but it just gives you an, an, an indication of how the use of the light data can be useful in, in sorting this, uh, this type of question, even for places where, unlike China, we don't even have the data. So we also know something about uh, uh, the channels of this uh, progress. Well, we see significant increase in investments, so the treated area 
have a surge in investment. This cannot be surprising. We, we see a surge in foreign direct investment. That's not surprising either. Uh, we see increasing the population. We also see a modest, a modest increase in the educational attainment of the labor force, uh, so some accumulation of human capital. And we see some increase on total factor productivity that suggests uh, that there is uh, uh, more innovation and more technological uh, convergence. So this, this is an example of how we can try with uh, you know, the instrument of economics and statistics in, uh, you know, in, in an imperfect environment, because this is far from being a, a natural experiment. Uh, but uh, we can try to get some, some sense of how different uh, policy reforms uh, actually uh, 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 succeed in generating economic development. Another paper that I want to draw uh, your attention, because I think it's key in understanding what happened in this stage of uh, uh, economic reform, is based on the work by Rui Shejia, um, uh, who is now at the uh, University of California, San Diego, former student at Stockholm University, uh, which uh, uh, is titled Pollution for Promotion. So uh, something that, uh, by all accounts, clearly happened is that uh, uh, the in system of internal promotion within the Communist Party at some point stopped being based entirely on ideological lo loyalty and became more and more based on some type of economic performance. And this transformation was essential in, in, in making China a very different country from uh, others in which uh, you have a single party uh, structure and uh, absence of the standard check and balances of democracy. So there is no question the fact that uh, the, 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 the ability of, you know, the, the, the Chinese miracle has to do with this uh, changing the, the goals uh, and, the, and the career structure and the career success uh, of the, uh, in, in, inside the Communist Party. But uh, uh, as uh, this has, you know, has become more and more silent in recent years, uh, growth at any, any cost has its dark side, especially if you give uh, uh, some, some uh, officers uh, a single goal, which is to grow, well, there are many bad ways of growing, and one of them is to abuse uh, uh, natural resources uh, and uh, people who live in an area where uh, uh, these natural resources are located. In fact, the high growth of China, as we know, has been uh, uh, c accompanied by uh, dramatic deterioration of the uh, 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 conditions such as 99% uh, of urban dwellers breathe air that would be considered unsafe by the EU, uh, there is severe heavy metal pollution in waters. Now, of course, this, all this is true, but can we quantify the effect of this policy? Well, uh, Ruiche does uh, something that I find very interesting. Uh, in particular, she argues that uh, the, uh, in order to uh, to be successfully promoted within the Communist Party, it's not uh, sufficient. You know, it's, it's like if you, uh, if you read uh, uh, my countryman, Niccolò Machiavelli, he would say that you have to be skilled, uh, you have also to be lucky, he says, but you have to be connected. And so political connection uh, are very important, and not every uh, member uh, of the Communist Party of China has uh, the, the necessary connection with the superior level to make a good career. So she argues that it's uh, the joint occurrence of political connections and um, <coughs> um, uh, and being in the, in, the, in the right place, in particular to be a, pol a provincial leader at some point during the career, that tends to generate uh, this incentive to, uh, uh, to push on economic growth. So in particular, what she does is uh, you know, since this connection between political leaders is uh, uh, partly endogenous, so you know, it could be that the fact that you are connected to a political leader depends on the fact that both political leaders, for instance, are successful at the same time. Well, she argues that she can identify some type of connection get, that gets switched on that are random. In particular, if, uh, if a, a political leader uh, enters uh, the standing committee of the uh, Politburo, and you have been in touch with that political leader when you were in school age, well, that connection, uh, she argues, uh, can be regarded as, uh, as exogenous. So what happens when uh, a provincial leader, for reasons that uh, are in this sense random, uh, has the opportunity to make, uh, to make a career? Well, she estimates that there is a, a significant increase 
in the growth performance of the area where the, of the province where, where this leader operates. Industrial GDP goes up by 15%, but she also documents that uh, chemical oxygen demand in industrial wastewater goes up by 25% and other measure deteriorates, and they do deteriorate more than it is explained by the higher level of industrial production. So the, the, the conclusion is that uh, this uh, single-minded uh, approach to economic growth uh, is uh, responsible perhaps for the high growth, but uh, certainly also for the deterioration. Okay, so now I want to, uh, uh, to mention uh, some work in which uh, I, am instead, uh, uh, I am instead involved. Uh, so this, uh, this is a, a paper where we try, to, uh, uh, we try to single out the mechanic of the Chinese growth uh, since uh, the start of the economic reforms uh, in, the, in the 1990s, in particular since the start of the process of uh, privatization. Uh, I mean, for many years, uh, economists thought, well, China is too peculiar to apply economic theory, and we try to challenge this, uh, this, uh, this presumption by uh, using uh, uh, economic theory based, of course, on some uh, uh, emphasis on some institutional characteristic of China. So what we know is that since 1992, China experienced a high sustained rate of return to investment. So Many economic theory would, uh, would argue that no matter how high this uh, rate of return is at some point in time, it should decline over time. That doesn't seem the case uh, for, for China. Persistent trade surplus and low wage growth. So this, uh, these are somehow three uh, key features of the economic growth of China uh, uh, since the 1992. The other a uh, remarkable feature is the accumulation of foreign assets. By running systematic trade surplus, China has accumulated uh, a large uh, uh, amount of uh, uh, reserves and foreign assets, and uh, uh, sur these reserves now amount to uh, 4 trillion US dollars. It's, it's close to, it's about 50% of uh, one year of GDP for, for, for China. Now, this is per se somehow puzzling because uh, you know, if from the point of view of uh, international capital flows, one might expect that uh, investment in China commands very high rate of returns, while we should not expect uh, uh, that capital flows out of China, which is what happens when China accumulates a large stock of, of assets. Now, of course, part of the story could be because China uh, is actually close to uh, portfolio investment, uh, uh, but this will still alone explain why China doesn't absorb the entire stock of internal savings to promote its own investment. So uh, this has been actually a very politically charged debate. Uh, some economists like Paul Krugman, for instance, have argued that this is nothing to do with uh, uh, the process of development of China. It's simply due to the fact that China adopts a distortion to its exchange rate policy and makes uh, some type of mercantilistic policy. It, it makes uh, uh, very attractive for, for, foreign, uh, for foreign countries to, to buy Chinese uh, products. Well, in this uh, paper we, we challenge, although you know, we don't target directly that explanation, we abstract from it, but we show that the nature of the process of economic growth of China is actually, uh, uh, in our view, uh, uh, necessarily leading to, to, to this type of outcome. So let me try to tell you uh, how we argue here. So China, so from a macroeconomic accounting point of view, uh, the, the, the net export, so the difference between export and import, uh, is identical to uh, what we call a saving gap, so an, an excess of savings over, over investment. So foreign surplus can be viewed as uh, uh, an excess of savings. So China, in fact, had a very high investment during this period, but had an even higher saving rate. Well, why, is China, why Chinese people save, save so much it's something that uh, it's a question of it on its own. There is a there is a growing literature that tries that has tried a number of explanations, which is uh, you know fascinating because uh, uh, the, the the household uh, uh, saving rate out of uh, disposable income is has been between 25 and 30 percent in China, and the total saving rate of China uh, has been of the order of 50 percent. So so these are a very large number relative to any Western country. I think uh, even even uh, relative to Germany, that is a very uh, thrifty economy. <laughs> no. So. Uh, you know, 
the, the, I, I'm not, I don't have time to, to review all of this explanation. We discussed them in the, in the article. Uh, one of the stories that I think is important is the precautionary motive. China has become, uh, as grow fast, people have become richer, but as, is providing very, very low safety net to the households. So the, what they call it uh, in the literature is the end of the iron rice bowl policy. Before everyone was poor, but everyone was uh, safe and knew, knew what, uh, what uh, to expect. Now, uh, individual income shock can be very, very important. The housing market reform, this is undergoing study that I'm doing with, with some people, may also have been very important because people at some point had to uh, satisfy some down payment uh, in order to uh, acquire a house, something that was not needed, uh, not, not needed before. Uh, people have talked about the issue of uh, family planning and one-child policy, the fact that uh, in, the, in the old days uh, 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 Chinese families could uh, rely on the support of their children, but now there are few children, some families don't have a, a, a boy, and that boys in the, in the tradition of the uh, Chinese uh, family structure was supposed to take care of, of, the, of the parents. In many cases, actually, there is migration, so uh, maybe they have a boy, but uh, uh, who knows where he is. Uh, and other studies have looked at uh, the issue of gender imbalance and how this... Uh, so for, for a variety of reasons, we know that people have been saving a lot. But this is not enough, because all these savings uh, even suppose that they cannot be invest in foreign asset markets because, uh, because it's institutionally forbidden, they, they, one would expect that they would channel internal investment and not uh, generate, not be partially parked into low yield activity like, uh, like uh, the, the uh, 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 American T-bills. Well, first of all, you know, here you see the picture. Indeed, since the late 1980s, interestingly, not before. In fact, in, in, the, in the earlier periods, China, China was suffering with shortage of, uh, of, foreign, of foreign currency, a very common state of affair for other emerging economies. You see, savings have been exceeding investment, with both saving and investment trading uh, upwards. Okay, so what is our story? Well, our story is that, uh, some Dorothea was saying, when one has to look uh, into the institutional details. Well, the important institutional details in our view is the, the financial system, and in particular, the credit system. So the banking system in China uh, finances relatively generous state-owned enterprises, but does not channel family savings to private enterprises. And these are the most dynamic part of the manufacturing industry. So growth, and productivity growth come mostly from the private side, but this private side is very heavily credit constrained. So the growth of this small firm hinges on entrepreneur savings, and the demand of loans from the uh, traditional sector uh, shrinks over time. And in fact, we see this in the data. Here you see in the, uh, the solid lines here are investment, and the dashed line are the savings. And we see that the, the behavior, of the, this is saving and investment as percentage of GDP, and we see here the corporate sector in blue and the household sector in red. So what we see over time, so the, uh, the difference between, so the corporate sector typically demand loans, in fact its investment exceeds the internal savings of firms. That's, uh, that's uh, not unexpected, but what you can see is that over time this gap shrinks. So the amount of investment that is financed by external loans as a shared total investment actually declines in the corporate sector, whereas in the household sector what we see is that, uh, well, the household also make some limited investment in the data, but mostly they are net savers, and you see that the, the saving, the net saving of the households actually increases over time. So growing savings and shrinking corporate, net corporate uh, investment or demand for loans give rise to this, uh, to this uh, surplus. And the way in which this happens, uh, I am summarized instead of putting a question in, uh, in, uh, in a slideshow uh, cartoon. So think of the economy as consisting of the household sector, uh, Chinese workers, uh, and private entrepreneurs. So in, in a normally functioning economy, uh, the households would make the savings, they would place them to a bank, suppose there is no equity market. In China in this period it was not very, very prominent. And then the bank would uh, use these, uh, uh, you know, savings they collected, these resources collected, to finance investment. Well, this happened in China, but it only happens for some part of the economy, which is these uh, state-owned enterprises. The Chinese banks, for, for a number of reasons that are part regulatory and part 
culture and, and partly related to the entrenchment of the banks that are mostly state-owned with the state-owned enterprise themselves, they do not provide uh, loans to the domestic pri private enterprise. This is not speculation. If you look at the data, you see that the amount of uh, f external financing that goes to the, the private sector is very, very small throughout. It continues to be very small. It's related to what we see today uh, with the phenomenon of the, of, the, of the shallow banking, incidentally. So initially, the, the, the private entrepreneur is a small part of the economy. So most of the savings are actually intermediated. We are in 1998. But let's see what happens in 2004. Now private entrepreneurs, the, the sector is becoming big. How? Well, the, the, they have their own savings. They invest them. They collect them with friends. We know that, uh, that uh, that's what happens. So they, they try to put together resources. They have good firms and good technologies, and they grow. As a result of the growth of these firms, state enterprises shrink, and their demand for loans actually, at least as a share of GDP, falls. What do the, the bank with this uh, increasing amount of savings that they get, given that workers actually continue to save, in fact they save a lot, and also their wage bill increases, although not very fast, well, they have no, uh, no demand to satisfy. These banks actually uh, swap them with, uh, with uh, government bonds of the central bank, and the central bank accumulates uh, uh, a stock of foreign reserves. And over time, because of this financial constraint, the accumulation of, say, of foreign reserves becomes bigger and bigger, and most of the more dynamic part of the Chinese economy becomes uh, self-financed. And you see, you see it also in the aggregate data. If you look at uh, the, the gap between foreign reserves and uh, 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 so, if you, if you, this is a, the, the, this is a for, sorry, this is foreign reserves as a percentage of GDP, and the red, the red dashed line is the difference between the deposit and the loans of the bank system in, in China, and you see that they co move uh, uh, quite uh, uh, quite significantly uh, together. So, so our argument is that this this is related somehow. The, the accumulation of these foreign reserves and this trade surplus is, is at least in part, and we think in an important part, related to the financial imperfection that characterize, uh, that characterize China. Okay, and incidentally, the, the theory, uh, th this, is, this is one observation, but the theory can reproduce uh, in also quantitative ways some of the stylized fact of China. So the fact that we have a sluggish wage growth is related to the fact that we have this uh, the transition between different type of firms with different productivity. We have a reallocation with the relative growth of, of uh, private enterprises uh, and uh, uh, a sustained high rate of return to investment that comes from the fact that on average there is a composition effect such that firms that are more productive become larger in the economy so the, uh, the average rate of return in the economy actually uh, increases. And we argue, well, this foreign imbalance does not uh, originate, or at least uh, did not originate entirely from political conspiration. We have a more recent paper where we also examine explicitly uh, what role in, in this can have a foreign exchange policy that we don't have in our, in our paper. Okay, so this is the past. Let me try to use uh, the remaining time to talk about uh, the future. So let me mention first uh, some of the concern about the sustainability of process of economic growth uh, in China. Well, the first is that uh, people have argued the process of market reforms uh, uh, has appeared to have slowed down. In fact, no major after the entry of the WTO, no, no major economic reforms have, have been entertained. Uh, there's been discussion about you know, this, the conservativeness of the last uh, spell of leadership under Hu Jintao before, before uh, 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 Xi Jinping be became the, 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 uh, the premier or the, um, <laughs> the leader of, uh, of China. So, so the, we don't see big changes. In fact, if we look at even at the statistic about the uh, employment share of state-owned firms, this appears to have flattened and even decreased after since 2008. So part of this may be due to the fact that there has been uh, an important uh, rescue package in 2009 that implied a lot of public investment, but part of this uh, uh, may actually be related to the unwillingness of the political system to let further privatization proceed. There is actually an interesting uh, paper that looks at the political economic roots of this by uh, a former student of mine who's finished actually this year, who argues that uh, uh, China actually aims at, uh, ha at continuing on the path characterized by a form of state capitalism where the state sector 
can be shrunk as it has now done so far because that increases efficiency, but cannot de decrease too much because there is an important basis of consensus that comes from the uh, people who work in the state sector who, as we know, uh, enjoy a number of privileges relative to the remaining workers. It could be that it's not entirely due to that, but the fact that uh, the composition of production in China has moved from uh, capital uh, from, from, from uh, textile and low value added sector into more capital and technological intensive sector has automatically implied a, more, a renewed role of state owned enterprises because these have been more resilient in capital intensive sectors as we document in our work. There is also new, another fact that uh, is in the data. Uh, we like it or not, there has been a, a significant improvement in the performance of state-owned enterprises. If one compares private enterprises and state-owned enterprises, the productivity of the private enterprises has been higher throughout the period, continues to be higher. So the presence, the excessive presence of state firms is a source of distortion, but that distortion somehow has become smaller in the sense that uh, uh, through reform uh, of the state-owned enterprises and through selection, shutting down the, li the least efficient one, it appears that in the last years there has been uh, uh, an improvement in the relative performance, at least, uh, of the state-owned enterprises. Incidentally, my student argues that this could contribute to slow down the process of uh, uh, further economic reforms and also possibly of political reforms. Okay, so you see the, 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 this uh, uh, slowdown of privatization. Some people actually argue that it's worse than that and that the data that we use, which is uh, 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 National Business Survey, and it's, uh, it's uh, the data, we have data on the, the universe of uh, 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 Chinese firm with sales over five uh, million yuan, uh, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, has actually some, some problem in attributing ownership. So it could be that this uh, slowdown is more accentuated. Another of the issues uh, ahead of uh, uh, Chinese economic growth is demography. So uh, as a, the result of the uh, one-child policy, but also of the family planning policy that were already approved uh, in, uh, in, in previous year under, under the, the leadership of, uh, of uh, Mao Zedong already, uh, China has enjoyed a very favorable demographic transition so far but it faces a very unfavorable democratic, demographic transition ahead. So if we go back to the 1978, you see both China and, the, and India have a very high total dependency ratio. What is the total dependency ratio? It's the ratio of uh, uh, children, uh, people who are either children or uh, in age of retirement, above 65, over the, total, over the number of people who are uh, working. Okay? So it means that in, in this initial period, there were many, many children, there were many retirees relative to the number of people who are actually, actually working. Now, introducing a policy of uh, uh, you know, draconian restriction of fertility, of course, helps to some extent because when these people, uh, especially the young people, of course, enter the labor force, well, there are fewer and fewer children. So that means that in 2013, 2014, which is here, we have a large share of the population that is actually working and a relatively small share of the population that is dependent. But that cannot last because at some point this large generation that is now working will become retirees. And that's uh, the remaining part of the path of China. You see India, for instance, has a much smoother path uh, path in, in, that, uh, in that respect. So how to take care of these elderly people, especially in a situation in which the traditional institutional form of family insurance is falling, is one of the big, uh, big issues for China. Uh, there is also an argument that says, you know, having a, an old uh, average uh, population can actually be bad for growth for other reasons. You may lose innovative spirit in some, to some extent. Well, that's the critical part. Uh, let me talk about uh, some instead of the, of, the, of the good news, of what I regard as uh, important uh, potential uh, sources of growth uh, in, the, in the future of China. Well, first, China can still do a lot 
uh, by further urbanization. And this is something in which the current leadership is already been uh, quite explicit. Uh, if, if you look at the, at the productivity in urban areas, it's about three times in productivity areas. So by just moving people to rural, uh, to, to urban areas and, and uh, uh, you know, t t or turning areas from rural to urban, you're going to have a high productivity growth. Of course, you know, uh, environmental pressure, social tension. I mean, the, 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 the process of migration has been heavily controlled by the authority and slowed down in the past years because there was fear that this would uh, come together with, uh, with uh, uh, some, uh, some undesirable uh, uh, social consequences and, and maybe political consequences is even. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the, uh, actually the increase in investment in R&D. This is a measure of the innovativeness of uh, a society, uh, China has made an amazing transition in that respect. I'm going to mention human capital accumulation. That's another area where uh, you know China may have less, uh, a smaller number of young people in future, but they may be much more productive because they uh, they have undergone uh, uh, many more years of education. Uh, internal demand may be important. I will not speak much about this. Uh, we are uh, currently working. Possibly financial market reforms, uh, if uh, uh, this actually managed to be, put, uh, to be put in place. Well, here you can see how the evolution of the population of China looks like. So today we are almost at the, at the top of the population by looking at some uh, of the uh, Common forecast, but what the, you should also note is that there is a potential of uh, increase in the urban population that can can continue for many years. So that's something to be taken into account. On the R and D expenditure, well, China in the 1990s uh, was spending 0.7 percent of uh, its uh, GDP, of its annual GDP, in uh, in R and D. This is a number that it would have, was placing China in in the middle of the group of uh, emerging economies. Uh, so we know that there is a robust stylized fact that as uh, economies become richer, they tend to spend more in R&D. Then there is variation. Germany spends a lot in, uh, uh, in R&D, Britain less, uh, and so on and so forth. But there is a strong correlation between the share of the GDP that one country spends in, uh, uh, in uh, research and development, which we take as an indicator of the investment in innovation and, uh, 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 and the level of development. Now, from 0.7 1990s, China has jumped to over 2% today, which is about the same as the European Union uh, average. Now, part of this uh, is done by the state, but not only. Even the innovativeness uh, inside the business sector is, uh, is very high when one breaks down that number. And here you see another big of the big transition of China. In the late 1990s, China was, uh, again, relatively investing relatively low in R&D, and, uh, uh, and today it has surpassed country like uh, Italy, uh, which is you know, not a, a matter of, pr of pride for me here, and the United Kingdom. The other, the other uh, important aspect is uh, the investment uh, uh, in uh, human capital. So the generation that has made the, the miracle in terms of productivity growth, it's, uh, it's quite uh, extraordinary because this, many of these people were actually, uh, they, they went to school, but in a, in, in a type of school that was probably not uh, necessarily preparing uh, people for, for uh, working tasks very well. It was a very, you know, full of ideological furor. These, were the, these are the, the years of the Cultural Revolution. And we will see, of course, less and less of these people because we start leaving the labor force. More and more, the people like Robin Lee, this co-founder of uh, the search engine Baidu, is a very interesting story. Uh, the one of Robin Lee, because uh, uh, you know this, this guy comes. This guy comes from a family of uh, uh, factory workers. Uh, he. Uh, from a, a region of the north, uh, north uh, inland China, and uh, he became, uh, uh, he was a very brilliant student. The system of schools in China is, uh, is very uh, careful in ranking uh, uh, quality, and so he was ranked the top student uh, in, his, uh, in his region, uh, in his province. Uh, it, he went to study to Peking University, and then he went abroad to the United States. He got a grant, and uh, lately he has been the founder of these uh, uh, important uh, enterprises. So the, the system, although the average quality, we know little, and probably the average quality of, of, uh, of higher education in China is still dubious, certainly there is a, a very important uh, part of uh, quality 
high quality oriented institutions that uh, are uh, becoming very, very important also in the academic market, for instance. So if you look at some number, the proportion of the population 25 and plus in tertiary education today, it's already six times as higher than the 1980s, but that's just the beginning because the tertiary enrollment rate today is 27%. And in the, in the last decade, there has been an amazing uh, increase in the number of pe people taking colleges. In the 1990s, it was the, con the opposite concern, that at some point there was even a, a decline in the, in the enrollment. So the fresh college graduates went up to less than a million in 2001 to over six million in 2010. The number of students going overseas uh, went up by more than fourfold, and now Chinese students are uh, uh, about 20% of all international students in OECD countries. Uh, if you look at uh, the last piece of study, although China has only submitted uh, uh, the city of Shanghai, so that could be biased, uh, they, have done, they have done extremely well. Okay? So, now, what does it mean for, for growth? Well, of course, all this, when we do a growth accounting exercise, these are the first thing we look at. So, we have to take into account all these factors and, um, you know, let me just give you also a sense of what the market wants in China today. Over the last 20 years, the rate of wage, so the wage growth, the average, has not been very high. In fact, it's been lower than the productivity growth, a fact that I mentioned before. But if you look at the wage growth for workers with, with a college degree, it was, it's estimated by Jane Yang to be 12.2% per year. So this means there is an amazing demand inside China of this type of qualified, qualified workers. Now, uh, one of the questions is wh whether China somehow uh, arrived at the end point of its uh, growth trajectory. Well, what I think is that China will not continue to grow at uh, 10% uh, or 9% per year. Uh, I think that any reasonable model you can use uh, can explain why during the transition stage you can have for a limited amount of time this uh, fantastic growth rate, but it would tell you that at some point ending that transition, the growth rate for, for the standard dynamic of neoclassical gro growth models will have to slow down. So we have tried to do something which uh, I admit, you know, it's very speculative. Maybe there are some uh, political shocks that at some point will, uh, will create big, big crises, so we abstract from all of this. But what a model would, uh, would predict a model that has also embedded, in fact, the transitional element I said before, is actually that the, the, uh, the growth rate of China will slow down and uh, we expect to be uh, in the order of 5 to 6% in the next uh, couple of decades. So this is, uh, you see, today we hear a lot of China's can China afford to grow at 7%? I find that argument quite surprising. Of course, uh, this is still a very high growth rate, and you can, you can improve the, 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 the quality of life of the people at a very high rate by growing at, se at 7%. But even if, as we argue uh, from a model, this growth rate is going to slow down uh, at the rate that the model predicts, well, China, according to our you know, very speculative forecast, in 2040 would be uh, at the level of development correspond corresponding to Korea. Again, I don't want uh, you know, people to take much out of this, but I want to say that the fact that uh, China's growth rate will be lower in the coming decade is, in my view, com completely uh, physiological. So the last, uh, there are a couple of things. I, I'm, uh, how, how am I doing with time? Shall I, can, can I? Another five minutes. Okay, fine. Good. Okay, so I want to talk about the financial sector because Already in our previous work, we highlighted the critical role and the problematic element in the process of economic growth of China in the financial sector. We did so before all the recent event made it so salient, uh, and we argued that uh, this was actually a very, a very weak uh, uh, financial system because, well, it's a very concentrated, there is a lot of market power in, uh, in a system of four large uh, uh, banks, and this market power is actually protected and maintained by very rigid regulation. For instance, if uh, someone wants to open a bank inside China, not a foreigner's, but a, a, a domestic, uh, a domestic uh, organization, well, they can do it, but they cannot compete in offering higher deposit rate than do these big, uh, 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 big four banks. So that, of course, makes uh, the process of entry very problematic uh, uh, in, uh, in, in China, and, and there is a lot of monopoly power. Uh, 
there is also, these banks are also sheltered from foreign competition because uh, uh, you know, China's capital account is closed. It means that uh, uh, foreign, uh, uh, you know, foreign portfolio investment uh, cannot flow in either direction. So it's not the case that a private Chinese firm can, can seek financing from uh, uh, a foreign bank located in another country, for instance. So, all of this has resulted, as, a, as was argued before, in a heavy discrimination against uh, private, small and medium business, in spite of the fact that these have been actually the most uh, dynamic part of the, of the uh, economy. And another thing, domestic savers have been earning very low returns. So in spite of the fact that uh, the investing firms have a high rate of return to capital, there is a big gap between this and what actually people receive, receive on their savings, which is extremely low. For many years, the real return on deposit has been zero, uh, and on a longer period, it's about 1% per year, so indeed very, very low. Now, uh, it's, uh, this is not in the, in the paper because uh, uh, we haven't uh, discussed, but I wanted to, to make the connection between this situation and uh, the, the so-called uh, shadow explosion of shadow banking. So you may have read in the uh, newspaper that there is a big concern because of the expansion of credit activity in China over the last uh, uh, three or four years that has not taken the form of uh, st standard bank loans, but largely of, of uh, uh, balance sheet lending through trust, uh, leasing uh, uh, arrangements, uh, uh, etc. So this is a source of concern because somehow uh, it's unclear to what extent uh, these, uh, these newly created uh, entities are solvable, and there is a fear of some type of Lehman moment, as uh, people call it. So actually, this is a phenomenon which is very diverse uh, in tweet, but as a common denominator. It is a way of roundabout the set of uh, uh, constraints that the regulation of the banking system in China imposes. Actually, some of this regulation impact government organization themselves. In particular, provincial and especially muni municipal government in China cannot issue bonds. So they have created this, uh, this uh, complicated structure of uh, generated firms that then uh, uh, get uh, uh, money by issuing uh, in an indirect way some bonds, and that, that uh, uh, has been a source of uh, 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 growing concern because somehow it's even difficult to quantify the extent of the exposure of this, uh, of this uh, uh, provincial government. Uh, it has also the been the case that private firms has, have used these uh, this new non-standard vehicles, uh, uh, except that uh, the, 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 here the concern is that uh, it has happened extensively in sectors that are very risky, either like the construction sector because they depend on a uh, housing market uh, whose future is quite uncertain, or steel and coal where prices are, have been falling and then uh, uh, there is a concern whether these, uh, these schemes are sustainable. Okay, so all of this has been closely connected with the boom in property and land prices because these have often been used uh, as, uh, as collateral. So what I want to say is uh, surely the current situation is a manifestation of the precarious, uh, uh, precariousness of the uh, uh, financial institution of China. I don't believe, uh, in fact, uh, I, I strongly don't believe that this is going to uh, bring uh, uh, to a crisis, uh, uh, you know, anything comparable to what happened in, uh, in the United States uh, uh, in 2008-2009. Uh, in and uh, there are a number of indicators that uh, suggest that uh, the entity of the phenomenon, the shadow bank in China is still a very limited phenomenon, much smaller than the United States. Actually, uh, what is classified as shadow banking is anything which is a bank loan type, but it's not intermediated by by, uh, uh, by banks, and uh, we have in, in all countries, I've seen that in Germany this uh, share is very low, but uh, in, in countries like the, the, the Netherlands or, or the United States is much higher than, than, than in China. It consists mostly of simple contracts that are localized. There is nothing like the phenomenon of securitization that we have seen uh, uh, in, the, in the time of the uh, Lehman uh, crisis in, in the United States. Uh, if someone, uh, gets a loss, that loss will remain local. Uh, there will be either people who have bought wealth management pro uh, products, they will lose money, or there will be some banks have to write off uh, some assets, but 
Chinese banks, especially the large banks, are very well capitalized, in fact, probably overcapitalized. It's unlikely that this will create a problem in the banking sector. Moreover, if you think about what number I gave you before, the, 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 the stock of uh, foreign reserves that are parked, most of these are low yield assets, parked in uh, 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 at the Chinese Central Bank amount to 50% of GDP. The total amount of the shadow banking in, in, the, in the most uh, uh, extreme uh, estimates, which I'm reporting here, is 50 to 70%. And of course, the Chinese government can issue new bonds. So the, the fiscal imbalance altogether is quite, uh, is quite moderate, even if the state had to intervene to, to, to fix it with a big bailout. Now, this doesn't mean that there is no problem, because we know that the bailout is a dangerous thing, because once you do it once, people expect that you will do over and over again. Uh, and you know, you German people are, are very worried about this, so I don't have to, to tell you. OK? So, so uh, uh, I, what, what I, I want to say is it's, it's still a bit uncertain, the path of financial reform that uh, will be undertaken by, by China. But uh, certainly, the government appears to have put this uh, on, as a priority in their list of uh, uh, policy reforms. Uh, there are plans uh, to uh, make, uh, actually, the liberalization of international portfolio transaction by 2020. I have a feeling, and uh, you know, if I were asked advice, I would say to be very careful in proceeding with this before having fixing the internal, the, the internal market, because that could be very dangerous and generate more instability. Uh, there are some experiments done locally with uh, a, a few uh, um, uh, special economic zones. Okay, so the, the, the last point that I want to mention, and I will be, uh, I will be quick because I, I'm going beyond my, my, my time, is the issue of income inequality. So I think that one of the threats to the current uh, construction of uh, so, uh, Ch Chinese society uh, is uh, uh, the, the large inequality and the fact that a large part of the population has been, uh, uh, you know, only to a limited extent uh, being part of this progress. Now, an example you see in the, in the newspapers in these days, how much of the uh, uh, growing protests uh, from uh, uh, blue-collar workers, especially from uh, uh, workers belonging to these uh, uh, unprotected uh, non-resident workers, uh, uh, and I think this is a this is a symptom of this uh, of this uh, of this phenomenon. Uh, certainly, this uh, concern has been part of the. Uh, you know, as enter more and more the political discourse uh, of the of the leadership uh, measures. Uh, well, some concrete measures, for instance, uh, public housing policy has been uh, uh, important. Uh, important action has been taken, but to some extent, uh, this is still unclear. Uh, the, the extent, the real extent of the commitment beyond the, beyond the rhetoric. What I think is going to be an important and pivotal issue is the reform of the pension system. We have uh, written a paper that I won't have the time now to tell you about, but uh, if you are interested, uh, please go over. Yeah? yeah, no, that's conclusion, you see. And so here's my take uh, on the, you know, the line that probably most people are curious. I, I believe that a slowdown of economic growth in China is likely, uh, will happen, and it's also part of uh, redirecting the, the, the process of economic growth, but uh, I think it will be, uh, in my, in my, according to our expectation, a, a soft landing. Now, uh, of course, the, there is a, an issue that we have not touched upon with sufficient depth, and I, I think that uh, I expect that uh, some of my discussants will talk about it, which is uh, the extent to which uh, uh, the political cohesion uh, uh, will, uh, will, uh, will be supported. Political cohesion may be you know, support to a non-democratic system, even, a, even an authoritarian system needs to have a sufficiently strong base of support, or at least of non-opposition, and cohesion internal to the Communist Party. That's, you know, the construction they have is a very delicate one. There seems to be a very, uh, you know, firm leadership at the moment, but this, uh, this type of uh, uh, crisis uh, inside this organization are always possible, as the crisis in the late 1990s uh, show. Thank you very much.
Okay, we are now moving to the discussion part. And before I, we start, I sh I've been told to warn you that uh, this uh, uh, lecture and also the discussion is filmed. So if you don't want to be on the film later on when there's a Q&A session, then uh, please uh, uh, you would have to leave the room uh, uh, now or uh, when we start the general discussion. Up to now, it's only the front that's filmed. Uh, so um, I'm very happy that we have two discussions here today, and in the good old tradition of the distinguished lectures, these are discussions from fields other than the field of uh, the speaker. And uh, uh, today we are, have uh, Wolfgang Merkel, who is the director of the research unit Democracy and Democratization. Is that right? I'm not saying that word often enough, I think. Um, and uh, 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 he will uh, represent the political science part, and he's also a professor at Humboldt University, I should say. And then we have Matthias Kuhn, who's the head of the Rule of Law Center at uh, the VZB, and a professor of law at, at Humboldt University, and also at uh, New York University. So um, I heard that you are starting. That's great. Good evening. and. Uh as you have heard, I'm the first ignorant who is allowed to comment on Fabrizio's paper. Uh, Fabrizio, thank you very much for your passionate and extremely informative presentation. And thank you especially for one slide. This was the satellite photo of uh, the Chinese territory, which showed us some of the economic activities. Uh, it compensated me to some extent for the torture I had to undergo to understand your mathematical equations and formulas in your paper. So I appreciate the elegance of the, let's call it the satellite light analysis. Uh, I commit a um, capital crime for a political scientist. I'm not talking about the present. I'm not talking about the past. I'm going to talk about the future. And I want to address two questions. And I want to pose these questions uh, to Fabrizio, because economists are more prepared or more daring to look into the future. The first question is the type of capitalism and its sustainability in the future. And the second one is the relation between that type of capitalism and the political regime. The question here is clearly, can a political regime, an authoritarian or autocratic regime, survive with, uh, with such a dynamic capitalist system. Uh, you describe and you take, I think you take this term over from other analyses, you uh, are describing uh, China as state capitalism. I'm not sure whether this is a sufficient description of this type of capitalism. You are talking about state-owned firms, you are talking about dynamic private enterprises, you are talking about um, a controlled credit sector. What you did not talk that much, which I think should be included in describing a specific capitalist regime, is the industrial relations, the way wages are determined, who are the actors who determine these wages? Are these bureaucrats? Are these the management of firms? Or do even the uh, state-controlled trade unions play a role? And so I would like to hear something more about that. I would also like to hear a bit more about taxes and state expenditures. What is the structure of these expenditures? How much does go into social welfare and education? We heard about research and development, and obviously in education, uh, China is to some extent, if it comes to social mobility, even better than all the OECD or most of the OECD countries. One word on inequality. You were talking about the Chini. The Chini is somehow higher than the one we see in the United States. 
Uh, however, we all know genies are not so enlightening. Uh, so then we look to the deciles or quintiles of the top incomes and the lower incomes. And uh, you are uh, reporting that uh, the share, the income share of the top 10% is increasing. This is what we expect in times of such an economic catch-up process. But somehow inspired by the recent debate on equality, uh, triggered by Piketty, propagated by Paul Krugman and Joe Stieglitz, can you tell us something about the top 1%? Can you tell us something about the top 0.1%? one percent, because this may be important whether we have an economic upper class which goes beyond the political upper class. Another word to the deregulation of the financial sector. Uh, having witnessed the financial crisis from 2008 and uh, the years later on, we are somehow warned if somebody talks about the deregulation of the financial sector. And if we would, or China would deregulate the financial sector due to a uh, fiscal uh, a gap, uh, uh, not a fiscal, a uh, credit gap uh, in, in China, does it not entail a serious risk for the global economy? Uh, the second point I want to address, the relation between uh, political regimes and type of capitalism. Uh, as we know, uh, China is what one can call a um, sound autocratic regime. Uh, all these uh, attempts to describe real democratization processes, I don't think they really grasp what is going on there. One could argue autocratic regimes have basically three pillars in order to reproduce their sustainability. The first one is repression. The second one is co-optation of certain political elites which became relevant in order to broaden the ruling bloc. And the third one is uh, the one we especially see in China. It is economic performance. Obviously, ideology, grand narratives uh, do not work anymore. And the heavy burden uh, now lasts it on uh, this economic performance. Soft repression, this is by the way what we know by empirical studies, is the most efficient mean for authoritarian regime to uh, survive. What would, so we can talk now, we have a kind of equilibrium, uh, soft repression, selective hard repression, not very often anymore, no co-optation, I see no co-optation of new political elites. Uh, and uh, a high economic performance. What would modernization theory tell us? Modernization theory would tell us China could approach what one can call a modernization trap, meaning economic growth uh, triggers urbanization, strengthens uh, the educational system, provides the people not only with economic but also with cognitive resources, meaning more education, and generates a kind of grave digger for autocratic regimes, the middle classes. So at least the modernization theory goes, and there is a certain dilemma of autocratic regimes which are based on economic performance, meaning if they do not show, uh, uh, demonstrate, or provide a good economic performance, then they cannot generate legitimacy. Then they cannot uh, generate specific support coming from the subjects, or you may call them citizens. On the other hand, if they are too successful, they generate those political or social actors which may challenge and they may have the resources to challenge the autocratic regimes. I don't want to go uh, 
too much into it, but there's also a Marxist reformulation of this modernization theory, then it is not the middle strata, it's very much the working class. And if you look to the 20th century in Europe, it was not the middle strata, it was especially the working class who successfully pressed for universal suffrage. So is the working class a potential potential uh, uh, democratizator in the context of uh, China. Last, very last point, uh, transition theory tell us the following story. We have heard about the slowdown of economic growth. Uh, Fabrizio, you told us you expect a soft landing. We like to hear it. I'm not so sure if all Chinese people like uh, to hear it. If it is not a soft landing, it is something which trigger a crisis which other people uh, expect, then you could have the following scenario. There is a slowdown of economic growth. There, the people could respond with the three basic um, uh, possibilities they have. Voice means protest, uh, giving up loyalty, and uh, going or using the exit option. And in these situations, normally autocratic rulers are faced uh, with a um, decision they have to make, either to repress or to liberalize. Uh, the successful repression was Tian Tiananmen, and the not so very successful liberalization we have seen in the Soviet Union under Gorbachev. Both can have heavily non-intended consequences, which may mean that uh, there is no soft landing, uh, but the regime is at the crossroads. I would like to hear something, what you have to say about these uh, possible scenarios from the point of view of an economist. Thank you very much. I think as um, we should go on with the second discussant uh, before uh, we start, uh, we of course give you the, the right to respond and then we might take one or two more questions, but I really want to end this at seven o'clock so that we can have wine and pretzels outside. So uh, I'm trying to, to work on that. But now, Matthias, it's your turn. Great, thank you. Let me say that I found uh, the story that is being told in this paper uh, an extremely illuminating one uh, and plausible one, so I learned a great deal. And the last thing I'm going to do as a theoretically inclined lawyer with a, a political science background is to criticize any of the modeling or any of the uh, specific detailed economic uh, claims uh, to be found in the paper. What I want to do instead is question the framing of the paper, contextualize the story a little bit differently, and bring into focus uh, something that you allude to towards the end that also Wolfgang Merkel mentioned, um, and that is the possibility and probability of political shock um, as something that we um, ought to take very seriously uh, in the near future. So, to begin with, um, questioning the framing. The way the paper is framed, it asks, to tr it tries to explain the forces that underlie what is called as the most significant growth miracle in history. Now, um, what I think one might also do, as just as an intellectual exercise to begin with, is to frame the, the issue quite differently. We might simply ask, why so little so late? I mean, think about it. 35 years of development, um, between 8 and 10 percent growth, um, and China is still um, in a position um, uh, in which the average per capita GDP is below the global average. Uh, there are still a number of, uh, of, of countries that we normally don't associate uh, with economic success, which have a significantly higher per capita GDP, as was already mentioned uh, in the presentation uh, and in the paper. And the reason why uh, we have reason to ask why so little so late is that historically this is an anom anomaly. So China was the leading uh, economic 
uh, actor and the leading force for uh, a number of centuries, certainly under much of the Ming dynasty in the 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century, uh, and remained right at the top of the food chain, basically, up until roughly the 18th century. Uh, under the Qing dynasty that only changed uh, in the 19th and 20th century. And so we must ask what exactly went wrong there. And the paper tells that story, and I'm not going to tell it in any great detail, but the short version of it is there was a lot of violence and ideology. So um, w whether we talk about the opium wars um, in the 19th century, whether we talk about the Taiping Rebellion, something most of you might not even know about, but at which 20 to 40 million people died, which in percentage of the world population at the time is higher than the number of casualties in the Second World War, um, or whether we talk in the 20th century uh, of the um, revolutionary situation, a post-revolutionary situation uh, after um, the dynasties were supplanted by republicanism, and then the civil war between the communists and the, uh, and the nationalists um, in China. Um, so there's a story uh, of violence and ideology um, that characterizes violence primarily ideologically based up until 1949, and only in 1949 there was a consolidation of power at least in the Chinese mainland. Um, but there's still ideology. And the disaster of the great leap forward just to, um, and the disaster uh, of the Cultural Revolution uh, led to a dismal performance of China uh, right until the 1970s. And it was only through reforms in the 70s, uh, reforms where ideology all of a sudden moved to the background. And it's nicely reflected in the following two, two sayings. Mao still said that it doesn't matter so much whether the train is on time or whether it is late. What matters is whether it's a capitalist train that's late or a socialist train that's late. And a socialist train that's late is better than a capitalist train on time. That's the power of ideology. Economy wasn't Trump's. It wasn't the only thing that mattered. Of course, economic development mattered. Everybody tried to look for ways uh, to push economically forward, but there were certain blinders, certain things that were not allowed to be thought, not allowed to be tested, because they were thought to be ideologically incompatible. Now, Deng Xiaoping is known for the following saying, I don't care whether the cat is black or white, for so long as it catches mice well. And so now we have a focus uh, which is, uh, uh, and if we now associate catching mice with economic development, as certainly Deng Xiaoping did, then we see we have an attitude of open experimentation, of careful testing, of transferring competencies locally, uh, of, of establishing as an experiment these economic special zones. This is the story that I think is very successfully told by Professor a zilly body. But it's a story that only makes sense in a context where you have centralized, effective, consolidated power in China and an ideological commitment to growth without any further restrictions or impediments. So it's within that context that the type of story that Professor Zalibody tells is a plausible one. The question is whether we have reasons to expect uh, that the, these types of conditions will prevail in the future. And here is, just to put it very briefly and shortly, and I have to exaggerate and simplify because of the limit of time, um, we have in charge in China a communist party which internally still tells itself the story and uses the vocabulary of Marxist-Leninist theory as applied and developed by various thinkers within Chinese history and applied to the special situations in China that outside of official party meetings basically nobody believes in. So there's deep and problematic hypocrisy. Hypocrisy because it undermines the legitimacy of the party. What supports the legitimacy of the party is its success and its ability, um, primarily its economic success, less its ability to co-opt certain um, uh, elites. Um, and of course, in conjunction with soft repression that um, uh, Wolfgang Merkel mentioned. And the question is whether a regime that is built exclusively or primarily on economic success and nothing else is likely to remain stable uh, if and when, actually I, I'd say when, um, the country is likely to meet a serious economic problems. It doesn't have to be a Great Depression. 
So there may even, even if we have a soft landing, um, if expectations of middle classes are severely disappointed, um, then I think we are in a situation that will require for the party to survive what you might call a re-ideologization. So the need to create some kind of cohesive story about why one support should support the party, notwithstanding uh, the economic troubles that the country may be going through at a particular point in time. And then we can ask, what are the possibilities? What, are this, what is the ideological turn? What are the contours, the possible contours of this ideological turn? And here are three possibilities. Uh, one of them, historically potent, but arguably no longer, is that the Communist Party will rediscover uh, its Maoist roots. There are Maoist minorities within the party still, uh, but I think for a whole range of reasons, this is not going to be the direction uh, that the party will go. Certainly under the current leadership of Xi Jinping, uh, we've seen the prosecution of Bo Zilai, who's a, a party member, a very influential, powerful party member, who was, was believed to belong to the Maoist uh, side, and he's been neutralized. And there are a wide range of other policies uh, that indicate that this is not the direction that the current administration wants to go, which is understand understandable if you think, if you once you realize that in China, China is the major consumer, the largest market for luxury consumer goods like BMWs and Mercedes. Uh, so preaching um, austerity uh, and, and minimalism with regard to consumerism as a virtue is not likely to come over particularly successful. The repressive costs and the costs in terms of economic development would be too severe. So that's not going to be the direction, I think. The second direction would be nationalism. So connect, uh, connect the story of economic development with the story of, and now I'm using the vocabulary that was recently introduced by the new president, with the story of the Chinese dream. And the Chinese dream is a dream of national rejuvenation. Uh, it is a dream which connects the idea of economic growth and prosperity for Chinese citizens with the idea of military strength and maybe even um, uh, military glory. So that's the vocabulary that you find uh, that's being used internally um, by some of the party membership talking publicly uh, about what the Chinese dream uh, might be. Now, this type of ideological turn is likely to go hand in hand, and we already see signs of this, with a more assertive foreign policy. So we might say many of the things that we're starting to see in the East China Sea or South China Sea, potential conflicts with, either with Japan or Vietnam or the Philippines or others, uh, are the kinds of things, pushing the envelope, just making strong claims, creating crisis-like situations um, to foster support nationally, uh, to claim, to be able to claim legitimacy, and also to create grounds for harder forms and or softer forms of repression. So under these circumstances, under nationalism, if you are against the government, then like, it's very likely that you're a fifth column of the enemy. So um, uh, what you need then in that type of uh, context typically is the creation of an external threat, an enemy, um, um, and um, it, is, it is clear that in this case, uh, the enemy will be one that, in, in connection with the way the national history is told, will be connected to, on the one hand, Western imperial powers with their ideology, and on the other hand, um, uh, the imperial Japanese um, and other regional actors who um, uh, have been competitors historically of China. So here we have a scenario now that even relatively analytically focused, uh, not normatively concerned uh, and analysts, realist analysts like Henry Kissinger, describe as a situation which in many ways might soon ref be analogized to the pre-World War I situation in Europe where on the one hand you have an old but declining empire, Britain, that's today the United States, and on the other hand you have a, an enthusiastic, economically strong growing upstart who is increasingly uh, demanding a place in the sun and loaded and articulates its self-understanding in identitarian nationalist terms, Germany. And in that type of context, 
um, um, just as before World War I, we might still believe that economic interdependence, strong economic interdependence, the gain uh, of mutual, the mutual benefit for further potential growth, um, as well as in the background an understanding that serious conflict, a war would be a disaster, uh, deterrence must still have some significance. But just, but these were thoughts that were also articulated um, before World War I. So in many ways, World War I, notwithstanding the prevalence of nationalist rhetoric, etc., was generally by most of the elites um, in the early 1900s, a belief to be highly improbable because of the deep interdependencies, the open and globalized trade, and the deep connections between elites that existed. So there the belief too was the combination of shared background interests as well as in that context, shared background culture um, uh, um, provided and an, and an understanding of the horrificness of war, and this was already after the Crimean War of the 19, 1850s, and it was after the experience of the American Civil War, which, which saw machine guns used for the first time in, in, mass, in, a, in a massive way. In all of that, in that context, all of these understandings ultimately did not prevent the war. So uh, the fear is. Uh, that the combination of a, a move towards national nationalism within China uh, and the danger of treading loose dynamics in foreign policy uh, might well lead to conflagrations that are not in the interest of anyone. Nobody believed when the First World War really broke out that it was really in the interest of anyone. So if this is not there is a, realists. This is the remarkable thing that's often underappreciated. Realists can't account for World War One. You have to be somebody who believes that ideas matter uh, in strange and counterproductive ways uh, to make sense um, of World War I. And the question is uh, whether we have good reasons uh, to believe that this com complicated dynamic of nationalism on the one hand and war on the other hand, with other words, ideology and violence, the key driving factors throughout much of the 19th and 20th century, might not make a re might not reemerge as significant uh, in the 21st. Now the alternative to that, and that I will only mention and not develop anything here, but I have to say this given that I'm, I, I run the rule of law center here, uh, is constitutionalism. So one of the ideological, uh, the third ideological potential beside leftist Maoism and nationalism is that China discovers um, or, uh, or an, and embraces uh, positions which ultimately would be completely unoriginal and reflect um, a liberal democracy self's understanding as they, as they exist not only in the West but in many other uh, countries uh, in the world. There is right now constitutionalism is one of the most uh, mentioned words in Chinese public debates, I'm told. So statistically, uh, among civil society actors and minorities um, are making their claims, the language and the ideas of constitutionalism are a serious uh, alternative competitor, uh, but it's a competitor that the, the party has, in a, in a letter recently, signed last year, uh, by the respective party res responsible member, uh, has described as animical and not to be talked about in public. So whereas in the past you could talk about these things at the universities, there were no sanctions connected to them. Um, that has now changed and you will no longer find if you go to Beijing, uh, outside of relatively small circles, you won't find law professors, for example, uh, talking about judicial independence, multi-party democracy, and subjecting party officials effectively to the rule of law the way you would have only a couple of years ago. So all of that suggests that there's a real conflict going on within China uh, with regard to nationalism as one set of ideas, the Chinese dream as it's understood by the current president, uh, and uh, those who are struggling in various ways, uh, perhaps in part within the party, but certainly outside of the party, for um, the spread of constitutionalism and the embrace of constitutionalism uh, in China. Thank you very much. Um, I think uh, I would like to give the word to Fabrizio again because you've been asked many questions. I see <laughs> many sheets of paper. And I think we won't, if you ha have a question later on, please ask it afterwards outside. We will have wine and pretzels and Fabrizio will be there so there will be time to discuss but there might be people who want to leave at seven and I don't want to, to keep them. So uh, the last word, Fabrizio, is yours. 
So thank you very much. I think both discussions were very, very stimulating, and certainly won't have the the time of or pretends to answer to uh, so many important points. Just uh, one thing I want to start is. Uh, there is, uh, you know, some people talk about American exceptionalism in a completely different context. I think that uh, we have to admit that uh, there is some form of exceptionalism uh, in uh, the Chinese experience too. I mean, if you look at history after World War II, there are a number of uh, uh, several, in fact, uh, uh, Roderick uh, talked about that a lot, of uh, aborted uh, uh, takeoff episodes. You know, countries that for three, four, five, six, uh, up to a decade, grew fast and then collapsed, etc. Now, we have to come to terms with the fact that the Chinese success uh, has lasted uh, for uh, at least 25 years, if we take the beginning of the 90s as a starting point. We can, we can discuss that. So. It's also hard for me to frame the, you know, the, 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 the future because uh, I don't find any good uh, reference uh, for making analogy. So it's very hard for me to understand what I should compare China to in order to say, well, China, China is going to fail. Other than, well, uh, we are, uh, you know, I am certainly uh, in breed with the idea that democracy is the best uh, uh, social system uh, uh, and also probably economic system. But uh, we have to come to terms with the fact that we don't have many uh, or perhaps not even a single example to compare with. I also have the feeling with all my uh, passionate uh, uh, defense I would be willing to do for, for democracy, that the description was, in my view, a bit too sinister. Uh, sorry, Matthias, especially yours. I thought, you know, one thing is to recognize that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a system in which uh, there is no pluralism, there are no, uh, no, no, no uh, it's not possible and not allowed uh, to form uh, alternative party platforms that would be repressed also violently. But uh, another is to say that there is no mechanism of participation. So I think that uh, the current system allows some form of participation, and in fact, I would dare say. Uh, more than uh, uh, some of the uh, democracy in some emerging countries do, uh, in spite of its, uh, uh, you know, in spite, in spite of this setup. So, participation in the election of the, in the choice of the, the local uh, authorities, uh, uh, discussion, universities. I mean, if you go to China inside university, you can have a, a free. Uh, an open discussion with uh, with the people. They are very careful in not letting, so I'm sure that if I want to publish a book, that would be another story. I'm sure that if I wanted to, uh, uh, you know, make a public speech, that would be another story. But, uh, I mean, it's not a system that is so tight as uh, I had the feeling was described. Even the notion, even the notion of uh, a Chinese dream, uh, it's clearly uh, an attempt to define uh, an identity, and I agree actually with the analysis that says you know there is something lost in the old communist identity, and uh, the the communist identity also has been re uh, revived by Bo Xilai and something that they want to stay away as much as possible. But to me, it sounds more like uh, you know sub replace Chinese with American, and you have an American dream and you have a Chinese dream. I think that there is an attempt to construct a sense of pride and, ident and identity that doesn't have to take the form of uh, uh, military aggression. Uh, I think, in, in fact, that China has been very cautious and will continue to be very cautious in uh, not uh, taking a confrontational stand with, with the West. In its regional area, it's a different story, uh, partly because there are also other, other, other uh, countries that uh, have taken a confrontational attitude. You know, the escalation of nationalism is, uh, at the local level is a Chinese as well as a Japanese uh, phenomenon. I'm not sure that uh, you know, we can blame it entirely on the, on the, Chinese, uh, on the Chinese leadership. What I think, 
So it's not about blaming, it's about the structure of the situation. Right. No, I understand. But I'm saying that in, I think that at the international level, I don't, uh, I don't see the, the, uh, this, uh, this military aspect of the notion of uh, Chinese dream that uh, has come part to be part of the rhetoric. It's rather a way of defining some success story in a framework that is different from uh, what uh, we are accustomed to think in, in, in the West. The, the other thing that I, I wanted to, uh, you know, I, I, I'm saying this with, uh, with, uh, with a lot of doubt because I think we, are, we all uh, have some limited understanding of what, uh, you know, what the future uh, will give us, give to China. But I'm not so convinced that per se the slowdown in the average economic growth is going to generate uh, a lot of discontent. To the opposite, I think that uh, the excessive pressure on a high economic growth has created a lot of pressure on society and of potential uh, discontent. So leaving behind a lot of people, particularly the, the pe people who have, have non-resident uh, non uh, rights, so these people have been forced to living standards that are uh, uh, very low, uh, compressing through you know, direct and, uh, and less direct mechanism uh, wages. So uh, what do you mean by direct and direct me mechanism? In the way it was, there was a question about how the labor market works. So the, the state-owned enterprises grant uh, a certain number of privileges to their uh, employees. And when you go and look at uh, how people working in the state sector uh, uh, respond to surveys about, uh, you know, the value of democracy, for instance, that su such surveys have actually been run. Well, these people are typically the least excited about democratization and uh, the most supportive of the system. So if I think about the, the coalition that has uh, uh, supported the, the, the Chinese uh, uh, elite uh, in the recent year, I see a surprising amount of support from the uh, Chinese middle class. So the enter Chinese entrepreneurs, in spite of uh, you know, the exclusion from the, from the granted from the credit sector, have benefited a lot from the fact that the Chinese wages have been compressed uh, so harshly. So those who have uh, uh, you know, most to complain about what has happened in the, in the recent years are exactly uh, the, the workers uh, in, uh, you know, low-skill worker, uh, workers in uh, uh, the private enterprise. And, and somehow the non-democratic system has provided a, a framework where this uh, uh, has been possible with, you know, low guarantee to, to, the, uh, to the workers, uh, low environmental standards, and, and etc. So I'm not convinced uh, that per se the slowdown of economic growth is going to bring uh, troubles to the, to the political uh, stability. Uh, uh, and uh, in fact, uh, uh, the, the, I think that the question is rather to what extent uh, the, the, the process of growth will be more inclusive than it has been in the past. Uh, for instance, uh, by enforcing a better environmental standard, by creating welfare state type institutions, and uh, you know, the pension uh, debate is, uh, is very important in this respect, precisely because as, uh, as Wolfgang has mentioned before, the explosion of inequality, although Although everybody, everybody in the end has gained, the, the demand from a society that becomes uh, richer and more, and more uh, uh, developed uh, will increase. And I cannot rule out that in the end the pure desire of uh, uh, freedom will, uh, will come. Uh, I just don't see this uh, as a salient uh, issue today. When I talk to Chinese people, uh, and I ask, you know, do you think that the pressure for democratization is, uh, is going to be one of the, 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 the salient uh, uh, issues in the next uh, five or six years? I typically get the answer that no, not because the people I talk to don't like it, because typically academics well, uh, are a great admirer of the systems we have in the West, but because they don't think that uh, there is a, a, a threat of, of, of that type. So uh, I, I think that another source of potential instability uh, is the possible uh, uh, the, the possibility of keeping the party together? I mean, I think none of us had had the sense of this Boshilai business how deep uh, uh, the, the threat was. But certainly, from the way it has been dealt with by the the, the elite, it seems to have been uh, uh, quite important. And the party could actually implode 
by its own uh, structure and the fact that uh, you know you have to put together a limited number of people, but uh, uh, the, the 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 structure of uh, power between them gives to each of them a lot of power. So uh, I think that to to summarize. Uh, I still find very speculative this notion that China has to collapse because uh, it is not a democracy. I don't think that there is uh, uh, one such, uh, such equivalence. I think that slowdown of economic growth can actually uh, uh, make the uh, cohesion stronger rather than, uh, than weaker. Uh, I think that this, the, the, the structure of uh, command is per se fragile because it, uh, it can at any moment uh, implode uh, internally rather than externally. So just then we uh, see the Communist Party as a kind of philosopher king who is wise enough uh, to embed, to re-embed the now to some extent neoliberalized economy by a social welfare state who who is creating such a welfare state? You must have pressure. You must have people who are interested in a, such a welfare state. Or you believe there is a benevolent dictator in the form of this mm. wise party? No, I, I don't believe so. I think that uh, the, 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 the political elite uh, understand, at least to some extent, the need to maintain a sufficient base of support. If you look at the debate that are having on the pension reforms now, it's, it's not that uh, they don't want to provide uh, benefits. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a debate about how to structure this, uh, this institution. And I think that the government has been very forceful in the, in the last years in, in forcing firms to contribute and making that, uh, that pension system uh, work. So I, 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 you know, I don't, I'm not saying that there is a benevolent dictator and, you know, my, my hope is that uh, that system, one way or another, gets replaced by democracy. But uh, it, it remains the fact that it's not, uh, uh, that this demand for more extension, for an extension of the welfare state institution is in the society. And even an autocracy, if they want to survive, have to give, to give responses. And I think that so far they have been wise uh, in, uh, enough to take this into account. Uh, I expect that they will continue to do it in future. In fact, the rhetoric, if anything, has moved more in the direction action of uh, uh, emphasizing, uh, you know, extending the, 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 the benefit to a larger part of the population. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's a great discussion and it would be wonderful to continue, but I think we should uh, finish. So uh, let me first thank you Fabrizio for his thank wonderful you. lecture, Matthias Kuhn and Wolfgang Merkel for his for their very interesting comments. Uh, and uh, last but not least, you for, uh, for coming and being here. So uh, let me invite you to have some uh, wine and pretzels with us. And if you have questions, please come up uh, and uh, talk to uh, the people who are knowledgeable on the panel here. Thank you. Thank you.